Good evening, everybody, and welcome to our session today on boosting benefits. Um, hopefully you're all comfortable and you've got a drink. Um, I'm just going to do um, a quick introduction and some housekeeping, if that's OK. So there are, um, I believe, 167 people currently on the session, which is quite big. So your microphones and cameras are all off. So you can sit in your pyjamas and drink wine. Nobody knows what you're doing. Marvellous. Um, so it's quite busy. Um, I do want you to ask questions if you need to. And we're going to do that through the chat function. If, so hopefully you've all got access to it. If um, you haven't for some reason, which I know can happen, um, then you can always email me any questions once I've sent the slides around at the end of the session. Um, I have mentioned we, we are scheduled to be here for an hour, but I do feel that we might um, we might drift past that. But if you do need to leave, then just leave. That's absolutely fine. Um, so the slides will be sent to you as well at the end of the session for those of you who've registered and I've got I'm going to send them to the email address that you registered with so you'll get a copy of those also. OK, um, so if you ask a question and I ignore you, it's met probably because I'm coming on to it and I will come back to you later on. Um, I'm going to show you the agenda and I'm going to ask that you can try and keep your questions to what we're discussing on the agenda, just so that we try and keep our flow as good and as consistent as we can do. Um, because again, with the big sessions, they can get a bit out of control quite easily. Um, so what we're going to do today, we're, we're here today to talk about how we can look at ways in which we can increase our NHS pension. So what we know, um, certainly for those of you that are in the Facebook group, is that the NHS pension provides us with a set of benefits. We're going to recap on those in a moment. And we have options about how we can increase our pension saving if that is something that we feel that we want to do. Um, so on the agenda here, you can see on slide two that there are quite a number of different ways in which we can do this, actually. Um, five, in fact, is what we're going to cover today. This is not necessarily an exhaustive list. Um, and what will be suitable for you in your own circumstances will really be for you to determine. But hopefully what we'll be able to do is give you some information that will enable you to then go away and think about what might be best. Um, within the slides as well, we are putting some links to where you can find further information if you feel that you need that as well. Um, and most of that is actually linking to the BSA, the NHS BSA website, because they actually do have quite a lot of information on there if you know where it is. So we put some direct links in there for you as well. So we are going to do um, a little bit of um, an introduction and that's going to include a recap, a very brief recap on the NHS pension scheme and how it works. If you feel that you need more, um, then can I suggest that you come to one of the other webinars, either the pre-retirement or the general overview, because we go into that in so much detail in those sessions. But I just want to do a quick round robin before we get going too much. And we're then going to look at these five key areas of how we can potentially increase our income for when we stop work. So we've got private savings that are not a pension private savings that are pensions and then within the NHS pension scheme we've got additional pension, ERBO and Prudential AVCs. I'm also going to talk briefly about added years um, which is something that is not available to new people but you might have an added years arrangement from legacy times that you've been able to continue with so we'll talk about that as well. And then we'll also cover very quickly at the end something called the annual allowance which you might just need to be aware of as well. Okay oh Hang on a second, Michelle cannot hear. OK, so let's get going then. So quick introduction then into pension schemes. OK, um, so those of you who've been on session before will have heard this. So hopefully this is just a bit of a, a recap for you. Um, when we talk about pension schemes in the UK, we can split them into two different categories and they are defined benefit and defined contribution. Now, it's quite important that we understand that and kind of high level how they work, because that then feeds into these options about how we can boost our pension savings. So defined benefit schemes are where you have a promise from the scheme to pay you a level of benefits. So the benefits are defined by a formula and to that extent, they are predetermined um, or predefined. And that's where we get defined benefit from. 
And those formulas relate to your salary and service usually. And what happens is the benefits that you receive from a defined benefit scheme is an annual income for life. So it's like a salary for when you stop work. So if I calculate that my pension is £10,000, then that's going to be £10,000 every year for as long as I live once I retire. So it's, it's a, a, a regular income stream for when you stop work. Um, now, the NHS pension scheme is a defined benefit scheme because what it's providing you is that regular annual income for whatever time that you choose to stop work and take the pension. OK. Now, the other type of scheme we've got are defined contribution schemes, and these schemes work quite differently. So there isn't a formula that calculates the benefits for us. Instead, the contributions that are paid to the scheme are paid into a fund and invested into a pot. OK, and the value of that pot can go up or down. Uh, and then at retirement, you then have decisions about how you can take those pension benefits. So there's no guaranteed income necessarily if you have one of these types of pension scheme. Um, so you have to just consider when you're looking at the options that we're going to talk about today, which of these is better for you. Arguably, a defined contribution is a bit more flexible. You've got some different options that you can have with those, um, but you don't get the kind of the set income. So there's no right or wrong particularly, it's just about what works best for you, but the two work differently. Defined contribution schemes as are typically what's found in the private sector now. Um, there's not, not many private sector employers that will still provide defined benefit pensions because they're just too expensive. Um, defined benefit pensions you generally will only find in the public sector now. I mean, there are a few, but there's not many. Um, so within... Um, Define benefit then, we've got the NHS pension scheme, as we have talked about before. This slide will probably look quite familiar to some of you. Um, we've got three sections in the NHS pension scheme. We've got 1995, 2008 and 2015. All of them are defined benefit because they all have formulas that calculate the pension for you. Um, and if you look at your total reward statement, if you can access it, then that will show you the annual pension figures that you have built up so far. Um, now, 95 and 2008 are what we call final pay or final salary sections. And that means that the pension that you receive from either of these sections is calculated based on your service. So that's the length of time that you were in the section for but adjusted down for any part time working or unpaid leave and a definition of your final pensionable pay. And you can see we've put the formulas there for you on the slide and the pension formulas for NHS work as a fraction. So the 1995 section, as you can hopefully see, is one divided by 80 times pay time service, and that would give us our annual pension. And then with the 95 section, we also get a lump sum of three times the pension um, and that's tax free usually. So if we worked out that my pension was £10,000 a year, then my lump sum would be three times that. It would be £30,000. 2008 is very similar, but we've got a different fraction. So we've got 60th this time. So one divided by 60 times by pay times by service. With 2008 and 2015, we don't automatically get a lump sum in addition to the pension. Um, we can choose to swap some pension for a lump sum, and that is sometimes referred to as commutation. OK. Um, so Karen's just asked, is the 95 still calculated on the best of the last three years? Yes. So the pensionable pay for the 95 section is the um, best 12 months in the last three years, counting back from your retirement date. So even though you are now in the 2015 section, it still uses your current pay and it is also full time equivalent pay. So lots of the questions that we get through the Facebook group at least one a day is if I go part time, does it affect my 95 pension? And the answer is no, because we use a full time equivalent. OK, same for 2008, full time equivalent. The 2015 section then is still a defined benefit scheme. We've still got formulas that calculate the benefits. Um, uh, this is a, what we call a care scheme or a career average scheme. So you can see we've got a fraction again, which is one fifty fourths. But what the way this works is we actually calculate the pension that you build up each year, every year, and then we kind of add them all together. 
So, for example, if we said my actual pensionable pay was 54,000, I divide that by 54, which is our fraction, and that means I've got a thousand pounds per annum of pension in the 2015 section. The following year, we would do the same thing again. So we would look at my pensionable pay for that year, and then we would divide it by 54. So let's say it's 54,000 again. If I divide it by 54, that gives me another thousand pounds. And then add that to the thousand pounds that I've already got. I've now got 2,000 pounds per annum of pension from the 2015 section. And the next year we do the same thing again, and then we do the same thing again. The 2015 section is also um, linked to CPI. So CPI is the Consumer Price Index, and that means it's linked to inflation. So the 2015 pension will revalue each year in April by the increase in inflation plus one and a half percent. So in um, April 23, it increased by 11.6%. And we now know that in April 24, it's going to increase by 8.2%. So that's really important because it means that it doesn't matter what happens to your pay, your 2015 pension is kind of keeping up with the buying power of inflation. Now, again, 2015, like 2008, doesn't have an automatic lump sum when you come to take your pension benefits, but you can choose to swap some for a lump sum at retirement, which again is called commutation. OK. Now, the normal pension age or the NPA, you can see there um, the normal pension age. Um, and I think this is important when we start looking at additional benefits as well. So the normal pension age is the age at which you can access the pension benefits without them being reduced for early payment. It's not the mandatory age. It's not the age that you have to take the pension. It's not even the earliest age that you can take the pension. It's just the normal age that's written into the rules. So for 95, you can see there that typically the normal pension age is 60 unless somebody has a special class status. I'm just going to pause at this point and say if you've got to ask me what a special class status is, you probably don't have one because if you've got special class, you know, you know you've got special class. But if you do have one, it will be 55. Uh, for the 2008 section, it is 65, and for the 2015 section, it is state pension age. OK, now it's whatever state pension age happens to be. So for most of you, it's probably 67. Just a heads up if you're like me and you're born after 1979. Congratulations. But it does also mean that your state pension age is currently 68. So it is not a fixed age. It's whatever state pension age happens to be now. That doesn't mean I can't access my 2015 benefits until I'm 68. If I want to access them at 60, I can do that. Now, what the scheme will say is, well, Laura, we were expecting to pay you a pension of £10,000 a year at 68, but you want it at 60, which is eight years longer. So what we're going to do is we're not going to pay you £10,000 a year. We're going to pay you seven and a half because you want to have your money over a longer period of time. So the pension gets adjusted down to take account of the fact that you want it over a longer period of time. So again, those of you who've seen me on the Facebook page quite a lot, please do not call it penalised or, lo or losing out because that's not the case really. What's happening is that you're able to um, take the pension earlier and have it for more years. And so the amount of money that you would get each year is proportioned to take account the fact that you're having your share, if you like, over a longer period of time. You can also take them separately. So you can take your 95 independently to your 2015 and so on. So there's lots of different options there. But retirement age is definitely a consideration when you start thinking about your kind of wider plan. And that's why I just wanted to talk about it today. So I'm just going to pause and look at the questions to see what we've got coming in. Um, and then I'm going to just talk to you about contributions. So hello, Neve. Um, there's been a lot of talk in the last few days about the state pension age probably needing to increase quite a bit. Does that mean those of us in the 2015 scheme are probably screwed? I wouldn't say screwed. No. So there's two things that happen, isn't there? Um, there's, the, there's the state pension age. And the scheme rules currently say the normal pension age is state pension age. Now, they, that could change. If the state pension age goes up to 107, for example, they might say, oh, well, that's that's not on. Let's let's change it. So there could be that. The other thing that they can do is change the factors. So when somebody takes it early, as I mentioned, 
they reduce the pension down because they take account of you having it over more years. So what they might do is say, well, actually, state pension age is so much later now, we're going to make the factors better. So it's still reduced for taking it early, but the reduction isn't quite as big because state pension age is later. So I think all we can do at the moment is plan for what we know um, and, and just work on that basis. You can't plan for things that might change because um, things do change all of the time. But I would just just focus on what you do know. Hello, Julia. Does the 1995 pension increase with inflation? Not while you are a member of the scheme. No. So while you are a member of the scheme, it is linked to your pay. So the 1995 benefits will increase as your pay increases, but it doesn't keep a separate inflation link such as the 2015 section. Once the pension is in payment, then yes, it has a link to inflation and goes up by inflation every year. All of the sections do that. Joanne, um, with the 2015 pension, if you are part time, is it the part time or whole time salary that's used to work out your pension? So for 2015, it is your actual pensionable pay. So if you're part time, it would be your part time pay. Now, I just want to clarify on this. For 95 and 2008, it, we use full time pay. But if you were part time whilst you were a member of that section, the service is reduced to, part, to account for part time. So it would be the same effect either way. It's just one of them uses service and one of them uses pay. So it, the 2015 isn't any less generous because of that. It's just that it does it through pay rather than service. Uh, Michelle, are there new reductions for taking your pension before normal pension age or do the old figures still stand? I don't know what the old figures are, but there were a new set of early retirement factors that came out towards the end of 2023 and they should be the ones that you're looking at. Those factors are actually more favourable to you as members than the previous factors, which sounds like good news, but basically it just means that they all think you're going to die a little bit earlier. Um, Sonia, can I take my 95 pension and lump sum at 60 and return to work still contributing to 2015? Yes, you can. That would have to be through a partial or a retiring return. I'm not talking about that today. It's a whole other webinar. Please book on one of those if you need to know a bit more. Um, can you do retire and defer taking your pension at normal pension age? You can. I would question why would you, do, you would do that, but you can. Um, is 95 linked to inflation if you are deferred? Yes. When you come out of the scheme, whether that's through retirement or deferment, it stops being linked to your pay. And so at that point, it's linked to inflation. Uh, does the 2015 scheme calculate career average since employment or in my case, 2015? No, it's too it. So you've moved into the 2015 section for all new pension from the date you moved into the 2015 scheme. So that could be 2015, it could be 2022, depending on the McLeod remedy. So that's when you start in the 2015 section. And as I said, it builds each year based on your pay each year that you are in the section. That's how it works. It's called career average, but it's career average for the length of time that you're in that section for. OK. Um, Laura, what if you had maternity leave and if your hours changed in the 95, 2008? So in, for maternity leave, for all of the sections where it's paid maternity leave, you're treated as you would have been if you'd been at work. So you would have been calculated on your notional service and your notional pay. When you move to unpaid maternity leave or any other sort of form of unpaid leave, you have like a break in the pension um, until you come back. If you then come back on reduced hours, and that was during your time of being in the 95 or 08 section, then the service is reduced to take account the fact that you're working part time. Uh, Jane, my 95 is deferred and worth 5k. Will this remain the same when I draw it in five years? No, because I've just said it's linked to inflation. So it's going to increase each year between when you left and when you take it by inflation. Um, Jane, I'm going to come back to that in a minute because that's one of the things we're talking about on the session today. She's asking about extra pension, but that's what we're going to talk about. So that was just a very quick rough and ready of the schemes. OK, um, 
we do a general NHS pensions webinar. There's loads of those scheduled throughout the year and pre-retirements. I think we're alternating each month, one of each. They will tell you all that you need to know about the other types of things to do with the scheme. OK, so if you need more, you need to go on one of those. OK, because we haven't got much time today to get through what we need to get through. Right, so let's talk contribution rates first of all. So you probably noticed that to be a member of the NHS pension scheme, you have to pay a contribution, it's part of the deal. And if you look at your pay slip, usually on the right hand side, you can see deductions and it shows you the deduction there. The rate of contribution that you will pay is based on your actual pensionable pay, okay? So if you look at the chart here, probably look at it, like or flying when I send them to you, find how much you get paid, pensionable pay, um, then that will tell you what your contribution rate is, and that is how it is deducted from your pay. OK, um, now that sometimes this is wrong, sometimes payroll have the wrong contributions, so you need to check your pay slips. I know it's not something that we systematically do, but you need to be looking at that information every month because you could be paying too much. And if you pay too much, it doesn't change the pension because remember, the pension is based on your pay. So it doesn't matter how much you've paid in contributions, it's about your pay. So you must make sure that you've paid the right amount of contributions. OK, now the thing about pension scheme savings. Um, is that all of your contributions and your employer contributions receive tax relief. So you will pay these contributions, the orange bars on this slide. Your employer currently pays 20.68% for each of you to be in the scheme. OK, that is expected to increase for the employer to just over 23% for every single one of you. So it's a massively generous benefit that you are having. Um, the contribution rates are being phased in. A change was proposed in October 22. So the first part of the change came in in October 22, and that's kind of what we're looking at here on this chart. The second phase is we think, yeah, right, Louise, we think it will be this year, but we also thought it would be last year. So we're not 100 percent. But the second phase will come in. And so these contribution percentages might move around a little bit later this year. OK, so just keep an eye out for that. Now, you get tax relief on your contributions. So can you see that the higher earners pay a higher percentage? But that's because the higher earners pay more income tax. So the higher earners, for example, in this 75,000 bracket will pay at least 40 percent income tax. So that means they get 40 percent income tax relief on their contribution, whereas somebody who's a lower earner will only get 20 percent. And so therefore, that's why it's kind of staggered a bit to take account of the tax relief to try and balance the actual cost to people. So for your NHS benefits, the contributions that you pay are taken from the pay before your income tax is calculated and therefore you receive income tax at your highest rate. So it's based on the income tax thresholds. For this reason, paying into a pension of any sort is one of the most tax efficient ways to save because there is no other form of saving that gives you tax relief on the contributions that you pay in or the investment that you make. So pensions are incredibly tax efficient in that sense. So to give you an example here, if you earn £30,000 a year, your contribution would be 8.8%. That would be £220, so 8.8% of 30,000 divided by 12. But actually, the amount that they would see reduction in their pay isn't 220, it's 176 because they get the tax relief. Similarly, if you're a higher tax payer, so you might earn 60,000, your contribution rate is therefore higher. So the monthly contribution would be £625, but you actually get 40% tax relief. So the cost to you is £375. So you can see it's almost double um, what the, the £30,000 taxpayer is because the salary is double. But it's that's why the contribution rate is higher because of the tax relief. Does that make sense? Um, Claire, so contributions are actual earnings. Um, it's quite... Quite relevant, that question, actually. Somebody asked on the Facebook group today because they said that their contributions were being calculated based on their full time equivalent, which is wrong. It changed in October 22 to actual. So you need to double check that if, if you're a part time worker. 
So the reason we talk about this is because when we're looking at additional pension savings, you will automatically get tax relief on any extra contributions that you save. So therefore, it's not costing you as much as you think it's costing you, is basically what we're saying there. So let's look then at the different options that we have. So as I mentioned, we're going to look at five key options. There are more, um, but these are just some to get some food for thought. OK, so the first option is you could just save. So not into a pension, you could save into some other savings scheme. So that could be an ISA, which stands for an individual savings account. It could be just a, say, a normal savings account. You might invest in property. Or there might be some other form of investment assets or something else that you're looking at. So these are all options that you have that are outside of pension arrangements. Um, all of them, though, you would purchase or save with your post tax income. So that means that you will have received your income from work. You'll have paid your income tax on it and then you put your money into savings. And so they are good options. They all do very different things. But you just have to think about what it is that you want to work for you. So as we said, pensions receive tax relief. And if you're doing something that is more investment based, you always have to think about the risk and return or even with property, you've got to think about the risk associated with that. And uh, one thing I will say about ISAs, um, so an ISA, whilst you are saving your um, your money after you paid income tax on it, with an ISA, when you then take it out, it's all tax free and you get tax free investment growth and you can contribute a maximum of £20,000 a year into an ISA. So an ISA is quite a good alternative if you want to kind of diversify how you're saving. Um, but definitely have a look at that and have a look at moneyhelper.com. They have um, lots of uh, general financial information, but you can find more information about ISAs and um, other options on there as well. So that's just to give you an idea that there are other things available. Uh, Sally, what do you do if you have pin too much pension? What do you mean, Sally? Can you reword that for me? So while Sally's doing that, let's have a look then at other pension savings. So you are able to pay. If you pay too much contribution, Sally, you need to go and speak to your payroll department and ask them why and get them to unravel it and give you a refund. Um, it does happen a bit, so it's always worth checking. Um, and this, I'll bang this drum quite a lot. People will hear me saying that you need to check your records, guys. You need to check your pay slips. You need to check your um, pension statements. You need to check your service records. All of this is on you. You have to take responsibility for your own affairs, OK? So it's really important that we do check everything. Yeah, Naomi, there you go. So premium bonds is another option. Um, few people have talked about premium bonds recently because interest rates are low. They're not so low now. I mean, they're coming down again, but that's a good idea. Um, so let's talk about private savings then. So um, you can pay into as many different pension schemes as you want to, in theory. There's no limit. You, you not only stop to pay into the NHS pension, you can have private uh, savings outside of the NHS. Um, most common ones that we would see are a personal pension or something called a SIP, which is a self-invested personal pension. OK, so um, you have different options, but they work in quite similar ways. Um, essentially, because these are outside of your employer and outside of your NHS, you would pay your contribution from your income after you've had your income tax deducted. So if I was paying into a personal pension, I might pay £100 into the personal pension. And then what happens is that you get 20% tax relief given automatically that's put back into the scheme. So I would get £25 back on top of that. So I've put in 100 but I've actually invested 125 because the government gives me the, the basic rate tax relief back. But if you are a 40% taxpayer and you invest privately like this, you will need to reclaim the other 20% tax relief through your self-assessment. OK, now these pension schemes are the defined contribution schemes that we mentioned earlier. So that is that you pay your contribution, it gets invested, the value can go up or down. 
Um, and then when you want to take that money, you've got a pot or a fund and you can then make a choice as to what you do with that. Um, we can talk a little bit more about that later on when we talk about um, the ABC with the Prudential because they work in a similar way. And I've got some slides to show you, but it does remove it from the NHS pension scheme. So you can keep something completely independent if that's what you want to do. Um, Hello, Alison. Yes, contributions. I'll just pause here because we're still on contributions. Contributions are based on actual pay from October 22. Prior to October 22, the percentage that you paid was based on your full time equivalent. So it was deducted from your part time, but the percentage was based on full time equivalent and that changed in October 22. Stuart, if I work part time, are my pension payments less than if I was full time in the same role? Right, last time, guys, because I need to move on with this. 1995 and 2008 are calculated using your full time equivalent pay. So going part time does not now affect those pension benefits. They are the same, OK, because you're not adding any more service and it uses the full time equivalent pay. 2015 builds up each year based on pay in that year. So if you were full time, any 2015 that you have built up has been based on your full time pay for each of those years. When you then move to part time, future 2015 will build up based on your actual pay then, which will be part time. OK. That's it. I'm not doing contributions anymore. All right. I can't. Uh, Michelle, tax relief is 20 percent. OK. But 20 percent. So so but it, but when you're doing it backwards, it's 25 percent. Don't ask. Anyway, it's 20 percent tax relief is the standard. OK, in England, if you do a private pension, Joanne, then the, the tax relief gets paid into the pension. OK. Because it's outside of payroll and therefore payroll cannot give you the tax relief. As I've mentioned, if you are a higher rate taxpayer, you have to claim back the extra by doing a self-assessment. So you just need to be aware of that. It's a bit of admin for you. OK, are we all good now? Yeah. Great, thank you. Let's move on. So let's talk about the NHS pension specifically. So we've we know we can do something outside of pensions. We can do a private pension. And we're going to look a little bit more about how that works when we link into the ABC shortly. Now we can look at the options in the NHS. So the two that are kind of related directly to your pension amounts are additional pension and something called an ERBO. We're going to start with additional pension because it's the easiest one to explain. OK, so with additional pension, what you're effectively doing is paying more contributions to buy yourself an extra amount of annual pension. So remember, your NHS pension is an income for life. So my NHS pension, I haven't got one, but we'll pretend, is £10,000 a year when I retire. I might want more than that. So I'm going to decide to pay extra contributions now, which will mean instead of my pension being £10,000 a year, for example, it will be £11,000 a year. Does that make sense? So you're buying yourself an extra amount of annual pension. You can choose to do this through regular monthly contributions, which would mean that they would be deducted from your pay in the same way as your main contributions. And therefore, you get the tax relief at the time that they're being deducted. If you do it as a lump sum, then you have to claim the tax relief back from HMRC, all of it. Um, so that again, you get it back, but it's just something to bear in mind. Now, it's quite flexible in terms of how you do an added pension arrangement. You can set it up and say, I would like to pay additional monthly contributions for one year and that will buy you a certain amount of pension. You can say I would like to do um, an additional amount of contributions um, for 10 years and it will set value an additional amount of pension and so on. You can decide 
how you set up the arrangement and what you want to do. Once you start that arrangement, though, you are kind of committed to it. You can stop, but if you stop, you'll only get credited with the bit of pension that you paid for effectively. Now, as I mentioned, with the monthly contributions, you will get tax relief in the same way as you do on your main contributions. But for lump sums, you have to reclaim that from HMRC. When you look at doing additional pension, you have a choice to whether you do single or for dependents. And what that means is you can choose to purchase additional pension that will just increase your pension pot but not your dependents when you die. Or you can choose to do additional pension that increases your pension pot and your dependents in the event of your death. OK, so this is what you've got to think about. Now, you can only now do additional pension in the 2015 section because that is the section that we are all now members of. We can't do anything with the previous sections. This all goes in to the 2015 scheme. Now, the positives of additional pension as well are it covers it's covered for ill health and death benefits. So as we mentioned, you can choose to cover your dependents with your additional pension in the event of your death, if you wish. It also, though, is included in any ill health retirement. So if the scheme medical advisor determines that you're too ill to continue at work, you might be awarded ill health retirement. And where you are doing an additional pension arrangement, that can be reflected in the ill health retirement benefits. For example, it can be in enhanced for no additional contributions for you to what it would have been had you been able to continue with the arrangement and not retire through ill health. So it does include an extra amount of protections in there as well. Additional pension is also linked to inflation from the time that you purchase it. So let's say I'm going to purchase a thousand pounds worth of pension in the next 12 months, but I'm not retiring for 10 years. That thousand pounds that I've purchased is then increased by inflation each year to when I then actually do retire. So although I've purchased a thousand pounds worth of pension, by the time I take my benefits, it might be worth thirteen hundred pounds instead. So again, it keeps its buying power. It keeps that link to inflation and it helps you with ill health and death cover as well. OK, so let's just stop a minute. We've had a few people come in saying I've been buying added years. Is added years the same? Right, everybody, sit up. Are you ready? Is this called additional pension or is it called added years? Who's paying attention at this point? I think it says on the slide additional pension, which means it's additional pension. When it's added years, I'll tell you. And you know what else will tell you? It'll say at the top of the slide, added years. OK, now what we all do on these webinars is our head runs ahead at 100 miles an hour and we start jumping in with questions that are not relevant to what we're talking about. You need to just take a minute and just focus on what is being said to you, okay? Because otherwise you're not listening to what I'm saying. I say this to my teenager quite a lot. And therefore you're not taking in the information I'm giving you. For you to get the most out of this, you need to just hang fire and listen and wait until we get the sec to the section that you need. Additional pension is not added years. Added years is added years. Additional pension is additional pension. OK, so I am talking about additional pension. Now, the only reason I've broken off to answer this question is because you're all not listening to me because you think it's added pension or you think it's added years and it's not. This is added pension. OK, lecture over. Well done, everyone. If you want to look at additional pension, there is a calculator available online. and I'm going to give you the link here but also to the section on the website at the back. This is what it looks like. So you put in your date of birth. I assume we're all OK with that. You put in the 2015 scheme because that's all you've got now. Um, you put in your normal pension age. So that would be whatever your state pension age is. 
And then you play around with these other things on this side, excuse me, because <laughs> these, and you can choose with dependents, as we said before, so death benefits, you can choose how much extra pension you want, you can choose how long you want to do it for, you can choose whether it's lump sum or monthly, and you can just play around with this till your heart's content so you can see what it's doing for you. Thank you, Karen. I think it's because I got angry. Um, so this is here there to help you, and this is really important, okay? So added pension, what it is, is you pay extra contributions, whether that's monthly or lump sum, and it increases the annual amount of pension you get when you retire. Now, what it does do is if it says it's a thousand pounds a year of added pension that you're buying, that is a thousand pounds a year at the normal pension age for your scheme. So for me, in 2015, that would be a thousand pounds at 68. It's going to be more than a thousand pounds because it's going to revalue by inflation each year. I can take it early. I can take it at 60 or when whatever I want to take it with my other benefits. But again, it would get reduced because I'm taking it earlier to have it for longer. So just bear that in mind when you're looking at the amount. It's assuming it's going to be paid from the normal pension age. OK. Just going to do added years and then I'll come back to the questions. If anybody would like to delete their comment, then please do. Right, added years. Look, it says here added years. Added years. OK, added years were an option that was available in the 1995 section. It ceased to be an option in 2008. But anybody who already has an added years arrangement in place has been able to continue with it. So if you're still doing it, that's why. Even though you're now in 2015, you are allowed to continue with your additional years in the 95 section. The way it worked was that you would pay additional monthly contributions, typically similar to what we were talking about with added pension, and it's buying you an extra amount of years and days. And the reason for that is because, as we know, the 95 benefits are calculated based on your service. So the length of time you've been in that scheme for. So if you're buying an extra five years, it's giving you more service, which is increasing your pension. The way it works in practical terms is that it adds little tiny bits of service every single year. So I'll give you an example. Let's say I was going to buy five years. OK, and I'm going to buy five years between 2008 and when I'm going to reach 60, which in this pretend scenario we'll say is in 2028. So that means I'm buying five years over 20 years. So that means each year I am buying five divided by 20, 0.25 years. So every year on my TRS, what you will see is your service creeping up a little bit more and a little bit more by those added years that you're purchasing. So it all doesn't all just suddenly appear at the end. It's gradually being added in. And so if you ever need to stop the added years arrangement, then you get credited with the bit you've already bought. OK, so those of you who are continuing in 95 with added years, um, even though you are now in the 2015 section, your added years arrangement continues unless you opt for it to stop. OK, right. I'm coming to questions, but I'm going to ignore some of them, as I think you've kind of gathered. Um, so. Um, uh, so somebody's asked, do you have examples of how much more you need to contribute to gain an extra 1,000, 2,000, 3,000? The answer is no, because it's age related. So it depends on how old you are. So that's why you need to use the calculator with your own details. And you can just play around with it. You can just stick them out in and have a look. Um, but it will be different for all of you because of the age factor. Um, how would someone work out how much extra annual pension in their additional contributions would equate to? Again, Neve, you use the calculator. I think we've covered that. Um, if you have your 1995 section in payment, can you purchase additional pension in 2015? Yeah, so long as you're continuing to be a member of the 2015 scheme by um, building up more benefits, you can absolutely continue to do that. It's one of the things that's coming up quite a lot with partial retirement. 
people are taking their 1995 pension um, but continuing in the 2015 scheme and then paying more in to boost their 2015 benefits. Yeah, you can absolutely do that. Um, I was bought, I bought some additional pension in 2021. I was told it would have to be in 2015. Would the McLeod remedy mean I get the choice? Yes, because you've bought additional pension between 2015 and 2022, which is the McLeod remedy, you will then have the option of having that put back. Um, I think actually it defaults. I think you will, it will default back into your uh, 1995 or 2008 section and it will get recalculated on that basis. Can I pay a lump sum of 15,000 from a private pension, Linda? Right, it's tricky this because the trouble is, is the contributions that you pay into a pension scheme, you get tax relief on them. Now, when you take a lump sum out from a private pension, I'm assuming you're talking about the 25% that you can take out tax free. So that means you've got tax relief when you took it out and then you would get additional tax relief paying it in. So you're not allowed to do that. Um, so you'd have to find some other way to source it. So, for example, live off the 15,000 lump sum that you got tax free and use your salary to buy yourself additional pension for a year or something like that. Um, you'd have to, it's semantics, but it's important. Um, hi, Maria, there is a limit to how much additional pension you can buy. It's about £8,000 a year of pension, which, to be honest, is going to cost you about 90 grand. So um, not many people do that much in one go. It also gives you all the tax issues as well. But um, so there is a limit, but probably not anything you need to get too worried about. Um, Hayley, I think I covered this, but additional pension can be taken early and it would get reduced by the early retirement factor. Um, Claire, does additional pension get added to your 2015 or sit sort of separately? Um, sort of both. Um, it sort of sits separately. So when you take your benefits, you have the option of taking just 2015 and not the additional pension bit. You can split them out like that. Um, interestingly, if you do additional pension, it's not currently reflected on a total reward statement. Please don't ask me why. I don't know, but it isn't. Um, yes, Jill, if you take additional pension and retire at 60, it's also reduced. So you need to factor that into your calculations. Um, Uh, so, Andy, I think I've just answered that by accident. Um, additional pension does not show on the total reward statement. It should show on the annual benefit statement. So you can ask for one of those. Karen, when you say committed to buying additional years, do you think it's worth doing additional pension over two and a half years? Um, the, the general rule of some, Karen, is if you can afford to, then do, because ultimately it, it's usually pretty good value. Um, it does depend on how long you're going to live for to receive the pension, which obviously is the million dollar question. But with the tax relief and everything, usually you need to live about 12 years to get your money back plus more, um, which you would typically expect would happen. So if you can do is usually, I mean, whichever option you choose is up to you. Calculate is very easy. Thank you, Elaine. I'm going to have to skip through these, otherwise I'm not going to get to anything else. Um, you can pay for one year. Yeah, you can just do one year at a time. D, start and stop as many times as you want. You can do that. So you could do one year and then you could do another year after that and then you could have a gap for a year and then you could do another year after that. It's entirely up to you. Um, you can purchase additional pension in SPPA. Yes, Deborah, I'll try and send you a link when I send the slides. Um, will paying additional pension reduce the amount of tax you pay if you're claiming your 1995 pension? So as we said, pension contributions, you get tax relief on them. So, yes, it would. Although stop focusing on tax, focus on other things. Taxes are a bit of a misleading thing to be focusing on. Um, you can only add to that 2015, so only select 2015 on the calculator. The £200 a month in your example, Gail, so the amount that would, it would cost you would be the gross deduction from your pay and then you would get tax relief on that. So the net cost would be less. The amounts charged for additional are more expensive. Is this because NHS pensioners do not add the normal? Yeah, exactly, Patricia. So when you pay your main contribution, a lot of people feel that added pension is expensive because you're, they're comparing it to your normal contribution rate. But for you to get your normal pension from the NHS pension scheme, your employer is paying nearly 21% in addition to your contribution. So for some of you, that'll be over 30% of your salary is going into the pension. So, of course, when you look at paying the same amount into added pension, it's not going to give you the same amount back. Um, I can't answer that, Amanda, that's advice. 
Um, like I've answered all the commitments. Erbo is different. I'm coming to that, Runa. Right, I'm moving on. I'm moving on. I've got to move on, everyone. Okay. Um, right, Erbo. Erbo is the hardest thing in the world to explain. So can we all just sit comfortably? Let's be like meerkats for a second and just really listen, okay? So an Erbo is only available in the 2015 section, okay? Now, what an Erbo is, is it stands for Early Retirement Reduction Buyout, okay? What it means is that you can pay extra monthly contributions, again, through payroll, so you get the tax relief. And what you're effectively doing is paying for your early retirement reduction in advance. OK, so what do we mean? Our normal pension age from the 2015 section is state pension age. Let's say it's 67. I think I might want to take my pension at 65. So it would be reduced for two years early. What I can do is pay extra contributions now so that when I take my pension at 65, it isn't reduced because I've already paid for the reduction. Does that make sense? So anybody can do this so long as you um, within three months of joining the 2015 scheme or at the start of each scheme year. So scheme year is the 1st of April. So you can't do it. Um, the reason we wanted to run the session now um, is actually shoehorn it in is because you've got this deadline of the beginning of April, really, or just after to start an Erbo if you want to. Additional pension and the other options you can do at any time. But this one is linked to a scheme year. So that's why we need to make sure we've done it now. Again, as I mentioned, you can only do it in the 2015 section. These are nice, these slides, aren't they? Nigel did these. And again, you get tax relief on your contributions. So what is early? So there are some rules around ERBO. So as we've said, it's before your state pension age. OK, however, it operates on a year on year basis. OK, so what does that mean? So you've been in the 2015 scheme from, let's say, the 1st of April 22. If you don't start your ERBO until the 1st of April 24, that means that from 2022 to 2024, you didn't have an ERBO. So your normal pension age for those two years is still 67 because the ERBO only applies each year that you do the ERBO for. OK, so if I start doing an ERBO in 2024, which lets me go at 65 without a reduction, but then I stop paying ERBO contributions in 2025, then in 2025, that bit of the pension is back at 67. So I've got 22 and 23 at 67. 24 is at 65 because I bought the ERBO for that one year. And then at 25, I stopped it. So it's back to 67 again. So do you see what I mean? You have to, it, it splits the early retirement factor across the different sections. So it depends on when you start it and how long you do it for. You can only do as well a maximum of three years early. So if my state pension age is 68, I could do minus one year, which would be 67, minus two years, which would be 66, or minus three years, which would be 65. I can't buy any earlier than that. I can still retire earlier than that, but I would have an early retirement factor applied. You also can't go below 65. So if your state pension age is 67, then you can only do minus two, which is 65. The other thing is, is that when your um, state pen, if your state pension age goes up, so if my state pension age is 67 and I'm doing minus two years, that's 65. If my state pension age goes up to 68, my ERBO automatically slides up to 66 because you're not buying an age, you're buying the number of years early. Right, other things about ERBOs. If you die, nobody gets the benefit of it because what you've done is you've bought the ability to take your pension early without a reduction. You're dead. You haven't taken your pension. Nobody benefits from the contributions. Similarly, if the scheme awards you ill health retirement, the pension gets paid without a reduction anyway. So again, you've paid the contributions with absolutely no benefit whatsoever. You can probably get the gist of how I feel about an ERBO. Now, ERBOs can work really well in some circumstances, and you just have to decide if that is your circumstances or not. 
Um, one of the um, advantages um, of an ERBO is the question that Fried has asked there is, does it count towards the annual allowance? Now, the annual allowance I'm going to come on to in a second, but the annual allowance is the amount of tax free pensions growth you can have in a tax year. With an ERBO, you're not adding to the pension, you're just stopping a deduction. And so an ERBO position doesn't affect the annual allowance. So it doesn't create extra pension growth for anybody who might have issues there. So that is one of the scenarios where it can work quite well. Um, but to be honest, what you'd have to compare is if you do an ERBO compared to doing additional pension and taking it early, knowing that you get the ill health cover and the death cover with an additional pension, what do you think might be better for you and your circumstances? That's kind of what you have to weigh up. OK. Does anybody, does that make sense? Um, I'm just going to have a quick skim through. Set up my Erbo last year, I'm 47, but can't work face work into 67. So, Claire, if you're 47, your state pension age could well end up increasing to 68, in which case your Erbo is going to creep up as well. Um, if you set it up last year, then it means you'll have a year without Erbo at least. Um, so you'll have a year that still has a normal pension age, your state pension age, and then you've got to keep doing it forever. So just be aware of that, otherwise you're going to end up with different ages. Um, Reader, can you transfer non-NHS private pay? I'll come back to that separate. Is it better to have an ERBO at the peak of your career when you were earning the most? I don't think it matters, to be honest. I don't know. I don't know the logic in that. Um, it, it would. Um, if you mean because you're building up more pension in that year than possibly, I mean it would be more expensive because you're obviously earning more money. Um, do late retirement factors apply to an ERBO if taken later? No, Matt, they do not. That is a good point, actually. So again, if you retire later than what you'd planned with your ERBO, you don't get any money back or a late retirement factor on the ERBO either. Um, so you just need to kind of think about that. Um, we've got a question, is it not worth it if your retirement age is 60? I presume that means if you take the pension at 60. So if your state pension age is 67, and you do an ERBO for two years early, that is 65. If you then take the pension at 60, it will be reduced for early payment, but it would be reduced as if you'd taken it five years early as opposed to seven. So you do still get a benefit from it, just probably not what you might be expecting. Yes, Beverly, that's exactly right. ERBO is a year on year thing. So you won't have an ERBO applied across all of the pension benefits if you only started it last year, that's right. You can, um, so Alvi, can you have ERBO and additional pension together? Yep, you can absolutely do that. And yeah, once you start an ERBO, you're best to keep going. Yes, and it gets more and more expensive each year. The older you get, the more expensive it is as well. So there is also an ERBO calculator kicking around somewhere, or there was, so it might be worth having a look at that as well. But go with caution because of things like the death benefits and the ill health, and you don't want to just lose those contributions. But, you know, if you're quite near to retirement age, it might work. Um, because you've not got as long to go and therefore you kind of just like buy, buying the time um, for your state pension age and stuff, it might be better. Um, OK, let's talk about the ABC. So I'm really aware of time. I'm fine for time, guys. I'm just kind of thinking about you. So the Prudential ABC is um, the ability to um, invest contributions through the Prudential. So this is one of those defined contribution arrangements that we talked about before. Um, but this is linked, with, it sort of has a dotted line, if you like, to your NHS pension benefits. Um, the way that the, the schemes actually work is the same as a SIP and a personal pension that we touched on at the beginning. So you kind of get a bit more insight into how those work. But these are these investment based arrangements. So with the Prudential AVC, again, you pay extra contributions. Again, it can be lump sum or regular monthly contributions, but these are flexible. So with added pension and an ERBO, you're told how much you're going to have to pay or you set the amount that you're going to pay. Technically, with one of these investment schemes, you can start, stop, up, down, change, whatever your contributions. You will have to give payroll a certain amount of notice and they probably wouldn't thank you if you were changing it every month. But you've got a bit more control in that if you need to stop for six months, you can stop and then you can start again. And so there's a lot more flexibility there. Again, you would get the tax relief if you did the 
monthly contributions because it's taken directly from pay and payroll would pay it straight across to the Prudential on your behalf. So that is all of the tax relief as well. You haven't got to claim any of that back. Lump sum payments are the same as before, though. You would have to claim back any tax relief on your lump sum payments. Um, you can choose the format of some benefits, which I'm going to talk to you about in a moment. Um, now, remember, it doesn't provide a set pension. What you're doing is you're building up a pot of money. But the way in which you access the benefits can then be suitable for dependents. So with these schemes, you, at current, you can access them currently from 55. Um, when you, we get to April 28, it will be 57. OK, um, and you can access it totally separate to your main NHS benefits. So sometimes what people like to do is build up one of these pots and then access it before they access their main benefits or access it with their main benefits to supplement their income until their state pension kicks in. So you've got a lot more flexibility with these, but you do have that risk about investment and it's a pot of money rather than a regular income. Essentially, what would happen is you pay your AVCs, you would have a deduction for some charges. The scheme will take a deduction for management charges to run the scheme for you. Hopefully, you'll get some investment growth and then all of those things added together gives you your total account or fund. And then when you want to access the benefits. So do remember investments can go down as well as up. It's very important when you want to access those benefits. You can do it in different ways. So whatever your fund is, let's say my fund is um, £40,000. OK, I can access 25% of that tax free. So that would be £10,000. And I've then got £30,000 left. I can then use that £30,000 to buy myself a regular income, which is called an annuity. So it gives me a regular amount of money. Now I could do that for life. Or I could do that for a certain amount of time. I could say just do it for seven years until my state pension kicks in and then I've got extra income that way. You can also do something called drawdown, which is where you pull out the 30,000 as cash and you could do it once or you could do it like £10,000 this year, £10,000 next year, £10,000 a year after. That would be subject to income tax assessment. And it's that is what is typically called income drawdown. So you can make the decisions about this at the time. So the nice thing about these is they are super flexible and you can make different decisions about these compared to your NHS pension benefits. OK, um, but you would just have to consider um, what works best for you um, and also what you might want to do with it and how you want to access it with these type of arrangements. If you died, and you hadn't accessed the money or it was still invested, then whatever is in the pot is returned to your nominated beneficiary. If you choose to get an annuity, so a regular pension, at that time, you can choose to have a single life pension, which would just be for you or a dependence one. So it would provide a pension in the event of your death. So you can make all of those choices. Um, the thing you have to think about is how long do you need it to last? So we have these types of schemes in the private sector. So if I said to you my pot was worth £200,000, that sounds like quite a lot of money, doesn't it? But if I said, oh, but I've got to make sure that I'm going to live for at least 25 years, then that's only going to give me about six or £7,000 a year. Um, so it's it, it depends on how they work and what you want to do with it in terms of what you need from the pot. But let's say that my pot is £50,000. I can take 25% tax free, which would be 12,500. And that means I've got £37,500 left. So if I want £100 a month, this is how long the, that, the rest of that money would last for, depending on investment performance. It's better if you look at this probably on your own. But basically, if we said that I had investment performance of 2%, then £100 a month is going to last me about money was that 28 years if i want 200 pounds a month it's going to last me a lot shorter amount of time and again 300 pounds a month as well so you have to think about how you can make it work for you but if you want it as a bridge between when you retire and taking your full nhs pension or when you retire and taking 2015 or when you retire in state pensions they can be quite helpful 
Okay, so we do you do need to just think about what you're trying to achieve by paying extra pensions. Um, now, when you pay in, as we said, the, the money gets invested. Now, the default investment option will apply. 99% of people are not comfortable with making their own investment decisions. Uh, you can, you can choose to change the investments, but it will go into a default option. And the default option is um, what they call lifestyle option. So what that means is that you the money goes into high risk. So the value can fluctuate quite a lot up and down. But then the closer you get to your retirement age, it sort of moves across into low risk. So if there's a big drop in the market right before you retire, you won't suddenly lose a great big chunk of your pension. That's the theory as well anyway. OK, so I'm just going to pause there. So there's quite a lot to take in. Um, let's have a look. Does the lump sum have to come from your wage or can you pay from private savings? Good question, Jane. You can absolutely pay it from private savings, but where you're paying it directly into the scheme, because it's not coming from payroll, you would have to claim the tax relief back from HMRC separately. You can do it through a self-assessment. You can just give them a ring and they'll give you a form. Um, it's a really interesting concept. If, if, for example, let's say I had 10 grand under the mattress and I was going to retire next year. If I put that into a pension straight away, I instantly get potentially 20 or 40 percent tax relief back on that straight away. So I pay that 10 grand in. I get two grand straight back from HMRC. It's quite a good rate of return, isn't it? So it's quite an interesting way to do it. Um, you can't obtain advice, Sally Ann, from Pru. There are there is information available on the website that might be enough. But if you need advice about these sort of products, it's a regulated area because it's an investment. So you need to speak to an independent financial advisor. Um, if the ABC can have nominated beneficiaries, does that mean it is in a wrapper and can be passed to children? Yes. So it's in a wrapper in inverted commas, Claire, which means it's under trust. So you fill in a nomination form or a beneficiary form and then you can leave it to whoever you want. And because it's coming under trust, it means it's bypassed all the inheritance tax shenanigans. Um, Sarah, if you draw down a 95 pension pot, can you then pay into an ABC tax free? Yes, if it's the pension, because the pension is income, it's not the lump sum. So yeah, you can do it that way. The best way to do it would be draw the pension, receive your salary, then pay your salary into the ABC and live off the pension because it's just cleaner. Uh, Non-dependent children. Yes, Claire, same thing. Same rules apply. Anyone you like. Um, you can, yes, Jenny, put in an initial lump sum and then a monthly contribution. That is also fine. Um, B time in Scotland, you start stand life. Yeah, sorry. I'm saying prudential. It, the provider in Scotland is Standard Life. It works exactly the same way. It just isn't Prudential. It's Standard Life. It's just a different insurance company. OK, so very quickly, I'll just cover the annual allowance and then I've kind of covered the key areas. We are running over. I do apologise. Um, but do ask me any other questions if you want me to come back over anything. You will leave this session, as you do with all of my sessions, with more questions than you came with. And that means I have done my job because it's opened the door to things that you didn't know were possible. And you now need to go away and kind of weigh up what is the best thing for you. Use the added pension calculator and play around with it. Does that look like it will work? If not, maybe the ABC is the option. All of those things, because it's it's the it's the classic Laura walk, don't run, don't run into this because you're going in blind. You might not know what you've signed up for if you've done an ERBO and you didn't appreciate how it worked and things like that. So walk, don't run uh, to make sure you get the right decisions for you. Now, the annual allowance is possibly something that you've never ever heard of and that is fine but what the annual allowance is is it's the limit on the amount of tax-free pensions growth somebody can have in a tax year so you remember we said you get tax relief on your contributions and all of those things okay the, there is the limit on the amount of tax relief you can have and that is known as the annual allowance now, the way it works for schemes like the NHS pension scheme is we look at how much the pension itself has increased by the tax year. Um, and it's a weird calculation. It's the growth in the pension times 16. For schemes like SIPs and personal pensions and the ABC, it's the amount of contribution that you've paid in. So when you are paying extra through an ABC, a SIP, a personal pension or additional pension, 
we need to make sure that you don't go over your annual allowance because if you do it might mean that some of the tax relief that you've got you actually have to pay back now that might be okay but you certainly need to be aware that that is the position um now the annual allowance um, this is the history of the annual allowance since it came into force in 2006 and you can see it was very high and then it wasn't. Now the annual allowance now sits at £60,000 from the 23-24 tax year. For most people you won't come anywhere near this but if you want to chuck a massive amount of money in in one go then you do just need to make sure that you're not going to breach your allowance. Now you are able to use unused allowance from previous tax years, from three previous years, um, if you think you might go over. So if you're going to say, for example, you're going to chuck 40 grand in this year and it's going to tip you over, if you had spare allowance from the last three years that would offset that, then there's no problem. But you do just need to be a bit careful of it, particularly those of you that are higher earners, because your pension grows at a higher rate because your pay is higher. So you need to just double check that. As we mentioned before, the Erbo is not impacted by this because the Erbo isn't buying anything extra or adding anything to the pension. It is just stopping a reduction. So therefore, that does not count towards the annual allowance. So you do just need to be a little bit careful when you're doing extra things to make sure it keeps you within the limits. Um, I won't go into it in too much detail because it's it's a really stupid, complicated calculation. Um, but what you can do if you think you want to pay more is ask um, NHS pensions for your pension growth amounts um, for the last four years and they'll be able to tell you. Um, I'm just going to put a star on that, but they should be able to tell you and then you'll be able to see what you can do. Um, the star on that is McLeod. So McLeod is rolling quite a lot of you back into your original section so they can't actually provide you any figures at the moment because they're having to revise them all as a result of McLeod but they will be able to in a few months so just to be aware of that okay um right questions that was quite fast wasn't it um oh there we go look um so for questions then um from the top Will an ABC bought out of a salary be tax free if 40% tax free is being paid? Yeah, so Sarah, this relates to any contribution that is deducted from your salary. So whether it's for an ABC, an additional pension, added years if you're still doing them, or an ERBO, the contribution is deducted from your gross pay before your income tax is calculated. So if you're a 40% tax pay, you get 40% tax relief at that point. It's only where you pay into a private pension or buy a lump sum separately that you'll have to claim the tax relief back. Helen, yes, you can pay into a SIP. Can you pay a SIP into an ABC? Can you transfer it in to me? Yes, you can. You can do that. Um, be aware of things like the charges um, and also fund performance. You might want to consider that. Uh, did you say draw 95 pence and keep working, pay salary into ABC and live off pension? Yeah. I didn't say do it. I did say that was an option. So yes. Yeah, because then what's happening is your um, salary is being deducted and paid stri straight into the ABC. So you get the tax relief there at that point um, and therefore live off the pension or the lump sum. What is the benefit of taking the NHS Pro ABC over taking a private ABC with Pro or another company? A really good question, Jane. OK, so probably the main benefit is that it's less admin. So if you're doing regular monthly contributions, as we've said, you're getting the tax relief all dealt with at once through your salary and it's just cleaner. Um, it might not be the best option, though. So um, the these funds are invested and other companies have funds that are invested. The investment might be better somewhere else. The charges might be better or lower somewhere else. Generally, with Pru, this way, the charges are a bit better because there's a lot of you. So you get kind of the benefit of economies of scale. Um, but not necessarily. So you do have to do your due diligence and look at different options. Um, if you want to do the Pro ABC for NHS, then yes, Maria, you have to be working in the NHS. But if you and you can't keep doing it if you leave, but you could set up a private arrangement with Pro or anyone else and you can do that for as long as you want. Erbos are eligible for tax relief. Any pension contributions are eligible for tax relief. 
Are additional contributions a safer way to determine an amount versus an AVC? So when you say additional contributions, I think you mean additional pension. So yeah, what you have to weigh up is with additional pension, it's a fixed amount of regular income that you know you're going to get. With an AVC, you don't quite know what you're going to get. You can sort of have a guess, but it all depends on the investment performance and also then what you want to do with it. So um, it's uh, the advantage of an additional pension over an ABC is that fixed regular income, if that's what you want. But there are also advantages with an AVC being the flexibility, the ability to leave the, the death benefits to anyone you want, grown up children and so on. So it does depend on what you're looking for. There's not particularly a right or wrong thing. It's just weighing up those different considerations. Claire, is the annual allowance of 60 pay the amount you can pay in? No. So I've got it on the slide here. For schemes like the NHS, remember the pension is not based on your contribution. It's based on the growth, in the, it's based on the salary um, and service that calculates you an annual income. So for NHS defined benefit schemes, it's the increase in the pension times by 16. That is your annual allowance growth. For the other schemes, it's the contributions paid in. No problems, Andy, we overran. No, it's all right. Um, can I pay, oh, Trish, can I pay additional pension to my to ensure my take home pay is under 50K so family allowance is not impacted? Yes, yeah, you can. So if you're, um, so your um, child benefit will be reduced if your taxable income is over 50K. So if your NHS salary is 50K, your taxable income will be less than that because you'll remember your pension scheme contributions are taken off first. Um, however, if when we take your pension contributions off your salary, uh, your taxable pay is more than 50K, then yeah, what you can do is pay an extra pension contribution, which will pull your taxable pay down so that your family uh, child benefit is not impacted. You can do that, yes. Um, Joanne, yeah, you can finish work and take your pension whenever you want. You don't have to take it when you finish. Um, how is an AVC different from a SIP? I think we've covered that. Mainly it's just the way in which it's administered. You just have to weigh up what's better. Is an AVC less risky than a private pension? No, Jane, the risk is pretty much the same. It just looks at the investments and so on. Erbo started two years ago. Is it worth to keep going as eight years to retirement? I don't know, Lorraine. It, you've just got to weigh that up based on what you think you want to do. You are closer, so usually those who are closer, it's a bit more reasonable because you're not going to have the movement in state pension age and stuff like that. Um, Angela, would it be good investment to take a lump sum from a local authority, defer the pension and pay additional contributions into the NHS pension? Possibly. Some people are doing that. You'd have to look at, do you get a reduction on the deferred pension? Um, how big is the reduction versus what you think you would get in pension? You have to do the maths. It's all about the maths. Um, hello, uh, Sue. Uh, Erbo started in 2015. How does it affect McLeod, affect the Erbo? Oh, sad. I knew somebody was going to ask me that. So, well done on starting your Erbo in 2015. As you'll be aware, because McLeod is rolling you back, um, you won't have been in 2015 now until 2022, which means you can't really have an Erbo because it only exists in 2015. So, you're going to get three options. One option, is that you can switch the Erbo contributions into additional pension in your 95 or 08, whichever section it was, instead. Um, that might be better if you want to go earlier, like at 60, for example. Um, the other option is you can take a refund of the contributions. Don't recommend that. Um, the other option is you can defer your decision until you actually retire. And then if you think you want to take 2015 from 2015, you can then retain the Erbo if you want to. So um, it, you're gonna, they will write to you about this later this year. Um, so it, it's worth considering and possibly looking at some modelling on it. I mean, my instinct on that is if you're thinking you want to take the pension benefits around 60, then the additional pension in the 95 section, for example, is likely to yield you a better outcome, but you'd have to check. Uh, Anson, if you want to start additional pension or PRU, who do you, start, who do you go to start with? Right, so I'm going to send you some links 
with the slides, which take you to the relevant sections on the BSA website, and that gives you information and also tells you what you will need to do to apply. For additional pension, you need to use the calculator, and then there's a button that says print form. So then that will give you the form that you then sign and give to payroll, but also there's information about how to do it with Prue. Okay. Um, so that's all fine. If you want to uh, do that, are you able to give paid for advice on which method maybe? Um, so Hayley, it depends on what you mean by advice. If you want somebody to do an analysis that says if you pay this, you'll get this from added pension. If you do this, you'll get this from a defined contribution scheme. Um, here is the information. Please make your decision. That's not advice. That is information and we can do that. Um, if you want somebody to say, this is what you should invest in, this is how you should invest, and this is what you should do, that is advice, and that would be an IFA. So it just depends on what you want. Uh, encyclopedic knowledge. Thanks, Jenny. Um, uh, buh, buh, thank you, very useful. Uh, Northern Ireland. Well, you're from everywhere today. I don't know. Let me just check for you. Um, I'm actively typing now. I'm not for, don't do loads in Northern Ireland actually because it's quite a lot smaller. Um, so in Northern Ireland, please hold. Um, just think to yourselves or something. Standard life. It's standard life in Northern Ireland. Um, so again, similar to Scotland really. Okay. Um, Alison, what's better at 59, Erbo or paying additional pension? Honestly, um, Alison, you'd have to do the maths. Use the calculators um, and see what you can work out. There's, I can't just, there isn't a black and white answer to that. Um, if with additional pension you get under 50k, do you still need to do the self-assessment? No, you shouldn't need to do a, oh, you would need to do a self-assessment because of the child benefit. Uh, no. No, in, in, in other words, Trish, what a, what a lot of life admin this will save you. Um, will the cloud affect additional contributions put into 95? No, because it always was 95 and it will stay 95. Um, I've been cooking dinner whilst listening. The household is in awe. Oh, my God. <laughs> Maybe they're just really bored, Catherine. Maybe that's what it is. Um, thank you, Frida, for Erbo. Um, I've got the links as well in the slides. Right, I'm going to stop. Let me stop the recording just in case. Um, I've lost. I've lost the. Uh, there we go. Right. Okay. So very quickly, um, before I finally stop, uh, as always, links you'll get on the slides, so you can enter to all the different arrangements. I'll send you the Scottish link for Standard Life as well, and my contact details, which I'm sure you've all got by now. Um, so well, let's stop the recording there because um, it's just going to run on a bit. Of